Um, yeah. For many of you, you probably don't need any introduction to Dr. John O'Connor. Uh, Dr. O'Connor, who I've come to know only since about the summer of 2006, which isn't that long ago, um, was a GP in my community of Fort Chippewan um, up until 2006-2007. Uh, worked in our community for um, a few years uh, prior to going public in 2006 about the disproportionate numbers of cancers that he was observing and other health issues in the community of Fort Chippewan and su suggested that perhaps there was a connection between car science development and many of the health and cancers that he was observing in the community of Fort Chippewan. Since then, he has become a big ally, uh, definitely uh, characterized by many residents of Fort Chippewan as a hero for our community uh, in terms of assisting us in profiling the many health and cancer issues that we're observing in the community of Fort Chippewan. He's been the subject of many um, press uh, or media coverages uh, around the world. Um, he's been the subject of documentaries like Downstream, um, which chronicles Dr. O'Connor's experiences in Fort Chippewan. Uh, Downstream was a short documentary. You can actually watch it on the internet. So when you go home tonight, if you search www.babblegum.com, B-A-B-E-L-G-U-M.com, and you search for Downstream, you can watch the short 33-minute uh, documentary about Dr. John O'Connor. That particular documentary was showcased at various uh, international film festivals around the world. It's produced by Leslie Iwerks, a uh, Hollywood director. Um, it was shortlisted from 32 films to eight films for a shortlist for an Oscar nomination uh, at the Academy Awards. It didn't make a nomination, but we're happy that it was on the shortlist. Uh, once the Alberta government got uh, wind of the fact that the Academy in Hollywood would potentially be considering this particular film for an Oscar nomination. They actually communicated with them and attempted to discourage the Academy from a considering this film for, uh, for an Oscar nomination. Because these types of films and, and Dr. O'Connor's um, passion to showcase to the world the, the uh, injustice of, of what was going on, not only with him as a physician, but the human rights issues of people li living in Fort Chippewan um, were very important. So, so on the dark side of what was going on, I'm sure Dr. O'Connor is going to speak about this, uh, he was actually charged by those very responsible authorities that we call our governments, Alberta and Canada, uh, to the College of Physicians and Surgeons on a number of different charges. Uh, which one of them included uh, causing undue alarm in the community of Fort Chippewan, which the community of Fort Chippewan vehemently rejected any notion of our beloved doctor causing undue alarm to our community of Fort Chippewan. We actually petitioned Health Canada, who lodged a complaint, and the Alberta College of Physicians and Surgeons to once and for all clear the charges of Dr. O'Connor, and that was done a year ago, and we hope that made some difference in terms of the college finally clearing Dr. O'Connor on that final charge. So I hope I didn't tell all your story that you were going to do, but <laughs> please help me welcome Dr. John O'Connor. Toronto, so this is kind of an ad adaptation of this. 
Um, yeah, I'm definitely not giving up my day job after seeing myself on screen, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, basically I'm a family doctor and uh, I first I think, came to Fort Chip in, in late 2000. I was based in Fort McMurray and a very large practice there. Um, I've been familiar with the issues in some of the uh, Aboriginal communities outside of Fort McMurray uh, prior to coming to Fort Chip. The culture fascinated me and I was, I was always sort of uh, late in the office if somebody would come in from one of those areas because so many interesting stories and, and just the whole approach to life, the philosophy was, you know, amazing. And coming from Ireland, never been exposed to any like, anything like this before. So came to Fort Chip with um, a notion of, of, you know, doing exactly the same thing. One of the things I was uh, told before going into any of the Aboriginal communities was that I had to gain the trust of the elders. Um, and I found, you know, that obviously very, very important because once you gain the trust, the community will accept you. If, if the opposite happens, then you're always on the outside. It was very easy because we're very, very easy to sit down and listen to. And uh, their stories were amazing. One of the... Uh, the things that attracted me about Fort Chip is the fact that it's a flying community for most of the year and it's, it's quite isolated. Also, extremely beautiful uh, on the uh, North Shore of Lake Athabasca, quite off the beaten track. I wasn't sure what to expect when I came to Fort Chip. I had seen some people coming into Fort McMurray that had you know, health problems, um, but you know, these were a small, very small segment of my practice at that point. I realized where Fort Chip was situated on Lake Athabasca at, at the receiving end of uh, the river. And, uh, and I was aware of the issues, or some of the issues around the river, you know, where uh, with the Alpac and then finally up into the tar sands. I really didn't know what to expect when I arrived. And uh, I was, you know, taking notes and, and getting to know people uh, over the first year or so. My first, um, I guess, knowledge, true knowledge of the people is the fact that they were so self-sufficient. Over 80% of the people subsist on what they can hunt, fish, gather, or trap. One of the reasons, um, probably not the biggest reason, one of the reasons was there's so much, uh, the, the cost of groceries up there was so much that my very first venture into the Northern supermarket um, I think a four liter jug of milk was 16 bucks and uh, you know and we're dealing with a community that doesn't have a lot of employment uh, so it obviously it was quite difficult for them to be able to afford to uh, live the kind of processed life that we lived in uh, Fort McMurray but that wasn't the only reason the community has lived there for I think 12,000 years Stuart and uh, deep roots and, and they've followed traditional ways for many many generations so that made me expect that this community would be healthy. As I began to get familiar with the, sorry about the, the title, um, it was modified a little bit. Um, you see it in a second anyway. Um, I began to get familiar with what was already documented in the community and, and in, in the charts, very well kept charts in the nursing station. Downstream without a paddle, that was added in recently. Sometimes it feels like that. So, um, I was really impressed by the number of people that had been diagnosed with various types of illnesses that I wasn't expecting to see in the community. Autoimmune diseases such as lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, thyrotoxicosis, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, kidney failure. And then various cancers, uh, and cancers of, of a type and number that it surprised me, given the fact that the population, according to the census in, in uh, Wood Buffalo, was about 900, but we were working with a figure of 1,200. I had about 9,000 patients in my practice in Fort McMurray, so it just didn't compare at all. So I got familiar with people. We got into sort of um, a pattern of, of um, basically doing the relevant investigation when people came in with symptoms and doing referrals out when necessary, ordering tests, etc., to arrive at diagnosis. Then I began to accumulate cancer cases of my own and also some of the autoimmune diseases. 
One of them which particularly alarmed me was this first one on, on the left, cholangiocarcinoma. I was familiar with that. My dad had passed away in Ireland in 1993 with this. It's a particularly vicious cancer affecting about 100,000 people. The big problem with it is that by the time it's diagnosed, it's often too late because it's so aggressive and so difficult to find. Very often the first symptom is tiredness. In my dad's situation, he began to complain of feeling tired and six weeks later he's dead. And they just diagnosed him the week before, before he died. So I saw one case of cholangiocarcinoma, and then I saw a second one, and that was in a, probably about a year's span. There were a number of other cases that looked like they could be cholangiocarcinoma. We call them bile duct cancers, or biliary tract cancers for now, but you're talking about the same little tube under the liver. So it's you know almost fitting here to call one cholangiocarcinoma and the other biliary tract cancer because they all come under the one heading. So the the powers that be now admit that there were two cases of cholangiocarcinoma and three other biliary tract cancers. That's huge for a population of 1,200 people. Then the number of cases of colon cancer they come in breast, uh, blood and lymphatic cancers. Uh, I mean the list is there. Um, so I began to discuss this with colleagues in Fort McMurray to ask, you know, the specialists especially, if they had seen anything like the type of pathology over the years uh, in Fort Mac, coming from Fort Chip. And as they sort of uh, thought back, they agreed that there seemed to be genuine pathology coming out of that community as opposed to any the other outlying communities and, you know, the, the average profile of the patient referred from Fort Mac itself. So I simply, at, the, at that point, was questioning why. You know, could it be a lifestyle issue? Hard to believe that, given the fact that 80% of the community is, is traditional in, in terms of the way they live. Could it be a genetic thing? You know, when you read up on these, there's no firm evidence that there's a genetic component, component to a lot of these uh, illnesses. And if there is, it tends to be a cluster in itself. Could it be bad luck? Again, I, I guess it could in the end be bad luck. Or could it possibly be related to the environmental changes that the elders continually talked about? They described the changes in the water. They, they described how they used to be able to go out on the lake and the river and fish and spend days out there drinking the water straight from the lake or the river, boiling it up for soup or tea, and, and uh, you know, life was idyllic, it seemed. Probably over the 15 or 20 years prior to me coming to the community, they had noticed the water changing. They couldn't drink it anymore. They talked about the fish, and the changes that they'd seen, the deformities in the fish, the tumors. Uh, they talked about the decline of the muskrat population. Uh, they talked about the ducks uh, that they uh, hunted and, and uh, increasingly would be unable to eat because the flesh was bad. And also they described the changes in the, the flora and fauna, you know, the, the berries and, and the, the traditional sources of, of uh, native medicine that they would uh, have relied on for generations. So simply asking that question uh, brought about some interesting um, reaction. In early 2006, uh, a reporter from the CBC radio in Edmonton came to Fort Mac to do a story on the twinning of the highway, or the lack of twinning of the highway, I guess. And he was sent in my direction by uh, one of the uh, long-term business ladies in Fort Mac, who happens to be the mother of her MP, Brian Jean, the conservative MP. She had connections with Chip, she was concerned, and she suggested that uh, Eric Dennison, the reporter, come to me. I was taken by surprise. When I said, this is what I have right now, and I'm kind of accumulating this, and I need to do something with it. I'd never been in this situation before, so I and really was trying to figure out what best I could do. I already had been told by many in Fort Chip that they tried to get their concerns heard over the years, but the concerns fell on deaf ears. They tried to get the fish looked at. They talked about a container load of fish that they had accumulated on advice from local authorities uh, to be sent out for analysis. And in, in the end, this container fish rotted and nothing was ever done. That was the, the, the common comment, nothing is ever done. I, I heard, I've heard that so many times. Anyway, Eric Dennison ran with the story, and it sort of took off like a, a wildfire. 
these are some of the media sort of outlets that uh, became interested. And it's still going on. There's five documentaries and stuff. It, it, it was kind of bizarre, you know, from a family doc from Ireland simply observing and, and reporting what it was finding uh, to be, you know, suddenly at the centre of all this attention. And it's, it's still, it's even more bizarre as each day goes by. But anyway, it'll disappear in the end. Uh, the authorities' reaction was very interesting. In March of 06, they came to Fort Chip, three docs from Health Canada. There happened to be a reporter from the Globe and Mail in the nursing station in Chip on that day. One of the dogs came up, filled a mug with water from the sink at the nursing station, took a big swig of it, put it down, and turned to the reporter and said, you see, there's nothing wrong with the water here in Fort Chip. Which was really a kick in the face for the community. It was a very odd thing to say, you know, all we were doing was trying to figure out, you know, th there seemed to be a problem. Let's sit down and ideally roll up our sleeves, look at all the information, come in and look at the patients in the community, do a baseline health study as had been recommended and suggested for years before. So anyway, they did a hasty uh, study of the deceased files in the community, incomplete by their own uh, admission, uh, about six or eight weeks after they'd taken the files out, they came back and told Fort Chip, you see, we told you there's no issue at all. There's no higher rate of cancer. In fact, in some instances, the cancer rate is lower. And of course, Chip didn't believe it, and I certainly wouldn't accept it, uh, especially as the, the study had been done so quickly. Well, it turned out that the reason why they ended the report so hastily was because the Energy and Utilities Board, the ERCB as it's known now, were at that point in time hearing Suncor's latest application for their Voyager expansion. And they were being asked very difficult to answer questions about potential health impacts of further tar sand um, mining downstream. So they were able to give the ERCB their answer, which satisfied the interveners and Suncor got their rubber stamp. We brought this up and, and we were not very popular with the powers of the Health Canada nor Alberta Health and Wellness at that point. So in you know, early 2007, after you know, continued, I guess, on my part, agitation, you know, from their perspective, I would call it advocacy and, and uh, concern for my patients. I got a nice big package in the mail from the College of Physicians. I had a whole list of complaints, everything from uh, double billing, uh, billing irregularities, uh, blocking access to files at the nursing station, engendering a sense of mistrust in, in government bodies in Port Chip, uh, raising undue alarm in the you know, community of Port Chip, in other words, disturbing the natives. Don't rile the natives, basically. That uh, took over almost three years to get that off my back. Uh, in the meantime, the nursing station, the community, myself, colleagues produced boxes, literally, of evidence to suggest that I wasn't guilty of any of them. The one that stayed the longest, the, the rest were sort of dealt with and, and um, you know, dismissed, if that's the right word, raising on the alarm that, that never left until November of, of uh, 09. And it's still actually not left. The college closed the file. They couldn't they couldn't say I was guilty, they couldn't say I was innocent with all the evidence, so they said, we're just closing it, so, you know, you're, you're good to practice. Anyway, uh, very, very frustrating time. The community itself stayed very active behind the scenes, and this is the one thing with Fort Chip, you know, even though they've relied so heavily on water, on the Athabasca, the lake and the river, they didn't get all, you know, anxious or panicky, they certainly weren't alarmed. They didn't go out and cause any civil disobedience, they didn't block traffic or anything, you know, climb the stacks like uh, Greenpeace did. Um, they diligently and quietly did their own study. They got Kevin Timoney to come up and do a, an analysis of aspects of the environment. And in, in November of 07, he produced evidence of appalling levels of arsenic, mercury, and hydrocarbons that affected basically their traditional ways. My successor in Port Chip at that point was Liam Griffin, a very good friend of mine. He was in the community at that time. The next day, he issued an advisory to the community for pregnant women and children never to eat fish. 
and then anybody else in the community do so no more than once a month. And he also advised parents, keep your kids away from the water. Now, Lake Athabasca is a playground for kids and for adults for that matter. But this is a big blow to the community. Health Canada the following day backed his advisories, but they also said we told the community for years about the fish. Nobody in Port knew anything about that. I was told there's notices up all around the community. Couldn't find one. And I, I didn't know about it as the community physician. That was my first my first inkling of it. So the 2006 study, the ceasefire study, kind of lingered on. This was evidence that there was no cancer in the community. Two si separate scientific analyses within a year of that study coming out said, no, your study clearly indicates a 29% higher rate of cancer. You're working with a small number of people. Poor Chip can't help being small. So you can't apply a, a, a method of analysis on what you got that's more suited to a population of 30,000 people or up to 30,000 people. You've got to look at the raw figures. The government said no, that's, that's completely wrong. There's no issue. Out of the blue in 2008, the Alberta Cancer Board announced we're going to do a comprehensive cancer study for CHIP, which was kind of weird because the government already, already said they'd done one. Anyway, this was good news and they said it was going to take you know, quite a considerable length of time. It took a year. In February of 2009, they brought out their findings and lo and behold, a 30% higher rate of cancer in Port CHIP. Among them, rare cancers, uh, some of them four to six hundred percent higher, and the cholangic carcinoma, of course, is thousands of times higher than in, you know, in, in the numbers, the raw numbers. So the rate of cancer in CHIP is, is thirty percent higher than what was expected. And at that point, they said, "We don't know why, but we need to find out." So we have gone on to continue to look into this. Every time. We question, and by we I mean, you know, probably at this point several thousand people, but science, people living downstream, and physicians question whether there could be a connection with the tar sand industry. We're, we're shot down. Kevin Timoney's report in November of 07, the morning after Alberta Environment, said this is faulty science and, and uh, it's, it's not true. Amazingly, in 2007 as well, Suncor had, I think they had um, commissioned Golder and Associates at that point to do an EIA for their Voyager expansion. Golder suggested from their uh, studies that, and extrapolating that arsenic could be up to 453 times the upper limit of what's considered safe if this continues, if, if you know, the, the mining expansions continue. The government said, absolutely not, it couldn't be. So on, on the one hand, you had Golder and Suncor saying this, and on the other side, it was Imperial Oil and Alberta Health and Wellness saying, no, that can't be. We'll do our own study. And they came to CHIP and they got samples of moose meat sent out, a paltry few samples. People didn't trust a, a, a dependable analysis was going to be done. And of course, they came back a few weeks later saying, there, arsenic will probably only be 33 times the upper limit of what's considered safe. You know, big relief. Anyway, uh, we continue to, to work. Um, Dr. Timoney published his paper in 2009. I was one of the co-authors, but I was advised just for, to save my own hide from further meetings, I should probably take my name off it. Uh, and again, he reconfirmed the presence of significant uh, um, what's the word that uh, Mel Knight uses? A, a contribution of degradation uh, of the water from tar sand mining. David Schindler, of course, uh, in his, what will probably be looked back on as the seminal study, uh, produced his uh, findings in Port Chip in early December of 09 of his year-long study of the, uh, the environment and the snow and the water. And he found levels of PAHs equivalent to about 11,000 metric tons every three months uh, entering the river, which is equal to a major oil spill once a year. The next part of the study, he told me earlier, is coming out in about mid-April. And uh, that's going to be even more devastating for government and industry. And we're also now finding that uh, n not just from the obvious thing, from the, the point of view of, of um, 
respiratory issues and, and uh, skin issues. We now we now know from U of A and uh, medical investigations that significant air pollution can accelerate, can trigger actually, or accelerate the onset of premature cardiovascular uh, disease, including strokes and heart attacks. And they've, they've now been able to pinpoint why this happens. And you're talking about the type of pollution that you would see in the city. They're not, they haven't even touched on the kind of air uh, pollution happening in uh, northern Alberta as a result of, of tar sand mining. Anyway, we have uh, continued to engage in uh, our battle. The community is still waiting some sort of comprehensive health study, and it's not even on the radar. One good thing that, that did happen is the Cancer Board suggested that in the report that we need to find out why this is happening. And now, they didn't say there's any urgency to it, but Dr. Fields, the head of the Cancer Board, a really good guy, a physician, said that his mandate, he was just asked to do the study and to give the, the figures. In the meantime, poor Chip um, has sat down, we've had five meetings now with Alberta Health, uh, the Cancer Board, um, Dr. Griffin, myself, and the Medical Officer of Health from Fort McMurray to put together terms of reference for an actual um, uh, plan to do some surveillance and biomonitoring uh, that should start immediately, specifically with reference to what was happening in the Cancer Board report. As late as last uh, December, when Dr. Schindler brought out his report, Alberta Health and Wellness, in, in, in the two statements in the media, said, when they were asked about Dr. Schindler's report, said, well, there is no issue with cancer in Fort Chip. There never was. Cancer in Fort Chip is, rate is no higher than anywhere else in the province. So they're sitting down with us in Fort Chip behind closed doors, talking about the next steps, while publicly they're telling the media there's no issue. We've actually pulled them up on this and, and we've demanded a clear, crystal clear, definitive statement as to where they stand. If we can't have clarity on an issue like this, nothing can happen. We can't go forward. I think, you know, at this point, that's the, uh, the up to date of where I stand. One of the things that um, I've come to conclude about George and, and his community. Uh, is that they are all heroes. This is a definition of a hero that I found in Christopher Reeve's autobiography, Still Me. An ordinary individual who somehow finds the strength to persevere and endure despite overwhelming obstacles. That's been poor Chip all along. They're an amazing, an amazing community that, that if they were living in any other location, probably wouldn't have been even as vocal as this. But th this is the extent. This is what they're doing. They're, and they've been, to the last person, uh, very, very uh, quiet and noble about this. They've taken the, the hits and they have picked themselves up and they've continued to stand together. This is borrowed from a group currently at the University of Alberta. Um, I think we all can attest, can agree with this, that we stand with Fort Chip. There's absolutely no backing off on this issue. The government are wrong, industry is wrong. The river is the exhibit A and the exhibit Z. The river has brought all this to light. If it hadn't been for that gorgeous Athabasca River and what it's produced and what it's given to science, we would be scratching our heads. I, I cannot wait actually until the middle of April when Dr. Schindler's report comes out and we'll see what the government reaction is. They've said all along that uh, their data does not coincide at all, doesn't support what neither Dr. Schindler nor Dr. Timothy have produced, but they haven't produced any data at all, which leads us to think that they probably don't have any data of their own anyway. Um, we're told industry provides it all. Um, in concluding, I think, you know, this, this issue is huge. That river needs to be protected. The people that live on and, and depend on the river and live downstream need to be protected. We can't shirk our duty, and we're not going to, I know that. 
we're all downstream of something ultimately and uh, I think if we only look around we'll probably find you know that there are issues closer to home but I think they're all related and, and or, or you know maybe um, lack of observation of stuff uh, that's closer to us uh, you know it needs to be uh, tweaked, tweaked a little bit and I can certainly vouch for myself in that regard from a family doc I know still a family doc but we're avid eco-terrorists I think in our, our uh, <laughs> past few uh, years <coughs> and uh, that's all I've got to say thanks very much for the invitation Fort Mackay now, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, so he's oh, Fort Mackay conference here three years ago. Celine Harp and I were here and they asked him to come to Fort Mackay and now he's back. He's in Fort Mackay. Hey. Sure. Dr. Connor, I really admire your efforts and what you've done for our people. For Chief Juan, Fort Marie. I lived in an area of work with many people in Fort Chief Juan. And I heard all the symptoms that they used to relate. Nobody listened to them. And certainly happy that you were there for them and still are, I hope. And we are with you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Dr. Connor, um, I've tried to get this information to you before, but anyhow unsuccessful. At the end of the Northern River Basin study, they had 169 reports. Uh, about 40 were on contaminants, and I know I was an NGO that reviewed them for the environmental community. They had found extensive contaminants in the tar in the uh, outflow of um, city food and sun for in those days. Uh, and out of that study, the, the Health Canada in, and the province of Alberta did a human health study, which I sat on. And the Ministerial Order by Halbert Johnson clearly stated that we were to take the contaminants found in the Northern Basin Study report and correlate them to the health outcomes. So Dr. Gabbles, I'm sure you're familiar with Alex McKenzie and Dr. Gabbles. Dr. Gabbles was our science director. Alex knows he was just our data stuff guy. And they took the health outcomes, as you know, and through a computer program, and put it all together. And to make the, a long story short, by the third draft, I was seeing ex statistically significantly higher incidence of, of things like COPD, cancer, and endometriosis in the communities in the north, specifically the Aboriginal communities. And the sad fact is, when I fought Oh yes, in the third draft, the environment stuff was coming together with the human health stuff, which was the ministerial order. The fourth draft, the environment stuff disappeared. And the fifth draft, by this time we'd gone over budget and we'd gone back and forth on it, and I would be fighting at every meeting and anyhow. So I finally said to Stephen one day, I said, how come the environment stuff's gone? Oh, don't worry, Sally, we'll do that in the next phase. And of course, it was the fifth draft. I finally said, well, has this been peer reviewed? We had actually set aside money for to be peer reviewed. He hadn't even sent it to be peer reviewed. And it was going to press in three weeks. But the bottom line of what I'm trying to tell you here is our chairman, which was, I won't say names, but if you want to know her, she was a me worry. On the third draft, when all this stuff was coming out statistically significant higher, she said to Stephen, oh, Stephen, I don't like that word. It's statistically significant. Nobody's going to understand it. Stephen said, no problem. And it was deleted from all the documents. 
it was changed to higher that higher than. So don't ever think the government didn't know there was a problem up there. This was in 1997. And when, when we had to send it off, I won't say any names, it was sent off and peer reviewed for, by three people here in Alberta. They weren't the original guys. Two of them said that the study was no good. Two of them also said that there was no way you could do an epidemiology study in any part of Alberta because they didn't have a population base for it. So when they started telling you about the 1,200 people, sort of, it was wrong. But it doesn't. There is a minister order <laughs> to do this right, and nobody ever followed it. Can I talk to you later? You sure can. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. Mike? Yeah. Right. Hello, Dr. Connery. Glad to have you back. Thanks. Um, and um, I, I don't recollect the name of this, but there's a consortium of doctors out of the U of A that's going to do a baseline medical study. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you were in touch with such an effort, because it was, it, was, uh, it was brought up prominently last year. There's been no, there's been requests for comprehensive health studies. But the only thing that's happened is this cancer issue, cancer study, and uh, a determination to move on to find out where it's coming from. Okay. That's been it. Okay, I'll, I'll try to look at that. Okay, thanks. So maybe we'll take one last question. So maybe the just presenters for the next session that was supposed to happen just now yeah. can make your way up to the stage. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I'm a chip one from Coleg too. We've got a big problem with Coleg too. After you're finished with Fort Mackay, could you come up there? We have. Talk, we talk have, to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> you were the bad to the family this time. <laughs> no, I didn't. Do. Thank you. Thank you. You did a good job. Thanks very much. Okay, we'll take one last question. Janice. <laughs> Thank you and please help me uh, thank Dr. O'Connor for the...